Welcome to Eric Hurst's Training for Climbing podcast. Training for Climbing podcast. Training for Climbing. Training for Climbing. Training for Climbing. Hello everybody, I'm Eric Hurst, back with another episode of the Training for Climbing podcast, and I think it's going to be another good one. You know, going back over the past six months, I did a detailed series. Actually, it turned into five podcasts on energy system training. And if you haven't listened to each and every one of those podcasts, please do so. I think it's cutting edge material, material that we're going to build on here in the coming months and years. There's a lot of new sports science, a lot of new distinctions that are being made, that are being realized by coaches and researchers like myself. And it's exciting stuff, and it's an exciting time because the training of the past was not all that effective, and we're learning now how to do things more effectively, how to train more effectively, and that'll empower us as coaches and climbers to reap the gains from training more readily. And for those of us who have reached plateaus, you're going to find new ways to break those plateaus. And for elite climbers, new ways to train and take climbing and perhaps the limits to the next level. So uh, it's exciting stuff. And again, the Energy System podcast over the last six months really set the stage for going forward. Now, in terms of the upcoming podcast, say heading into this winter season, uh, Northern Hemisphere winter, I guess I should say, uh, going to do a couple of podcasts on specific training uh, of the forearms, uh, fingerboard training, probably talk some about campus training, and tendon training. That's not something I think most climbers have ever even really thought about because, you know, kind of the old school paradigm is that training is all about muscles, making the muscle fibers stronger and bigger, you know, lifting heavier weights. Uh, Many sports are interested in developing bigger muscles because, you know, the school of thought has been and most exercise physiology textbooks talk about strength being proportional to the cross-sectional area of a muscle. And so if you want more strength, you need to build a larger cross-sectional area. You need to make your muscles bigger. Well, you know, climbers don't really want to do that. Uh, People in strength to weight ratio and power to weight ratio sports want to get stronger without getting heavier. I'm thinking about, you know, gymnasts and uh, Olympic lifters, you know, weight class sports, MMA, uh, uh, track and field, uh, power to weight ratio is very important. And rock climbing, of course. Uh, The best climbers, for the most part, aren't getting bigger year over year, but they are getting more powerful and their strength to weight ratio is increasing a little bit season over season. And of course, there's distinct strategies to do this. And we're just now beginning to understand how these gains come about. If the muscle isn't getting bigger, well, then it must be getting more efficient at transmitting force and more efficient at recruitment. We've known now for many years, more than 20 years, that the nervous system, and getting muscle fibers to fire more synchronously is important. That helps increase the rate of force development. But some new research just in the last few years, stuff that I've been studying, some of it not even published yet, is starting to reveal that the tendons, the uh, collagen fibers, not only in the tendon, but in the extracellular matrix that uh, kind of covers uh, and is interlaced within the muscles serve as a scaffold that transmits force from the muscle to the tendon to the bone and the more organized that collagen tissue the stiffer the more cross links there are the more quickly force is transferred and the less energy that is lost in that force transfer. And so once your 
the muscle fibers, the contractile proteins have been made about as strong as they can get. And that happens maybe in just a few years of training. Beyond that point, most training gains come very slowly because they require tightening up of the structure, a stiffening of the structure. Uh, and it requires very specific, forceful, sometimes heavy training protocols that will bring about these very gradual changes in the structure and hopefully do so without getting injured. So if that sounds like exciting stuff, just wait for the next couple of podcasts. And I'll tell you, it should excite you because this type of information, uh, the new research, the new interventions that are going to result from this research is going to set the stage for taking training for climbing to the next level in the next few years. And so, of course, the basis for these advances largely comes from the researchers out of the lab. People that aren't necessarily coaches or high-end climbers themselves, but people that uh, understand the biomechanics and the exercise physiology of what is going on and have an imagination to experiment with uh, new things and make new distinctions and discoveries. And that's kind of where this podcast is going, uh, is to take a look at some of the new climbing research that is being done. And specifically, I'm going to share with you a few of the presentations from the 4th International Rock Climbers Researchers Association Congress, which I attended in Chamonix, France this summer. And I was honored to be one of the presenters, uh, one of I guess, approximately 40 presenters from around the world that came in to share what they're working on. And there were uh, well over 200 people in attendance, not just the researchers, but doctors and interested climbers and some of the top coaches from around the world were at this conference, and a few of them even presented at this conference. And so uh, it was a uh, an exciting and inspiring week in Chamonix uh, to be with this group of individuals and exchanging ideas and, um, you know, that's that kind of cross-pollination that occurs when you get a bunch of like-minded individuals, though with different backgrounds together, and that's where you can kind of synthesize some new ideas and maybe have uh, some moments of enlightenment and have your imagination spurred on and really set the stage for perhaps some new studies that will get done in the next few years. And that'll lead us into the next Congress, the fifth gathering of the International Rock Climbers Researchers Association in 2020. And that will be held in Tokyo, which happens to be where the Olympics are in 2020, uh, where climbing will finally debut in the Olympics. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about this summer's researcher conference. Um, It was a week long, and kind of each day that we met had a different focus. There was a day with presentations on biomechanics and engineering, and then a day on medicine and injury, a day on exercise physiology, a day on the sociology of climbing and climbing-related activities, Uh, and then a day on psychology, kind of the mental side of things, motor control, and then at the end, the final day, kind of a capstone day where everything came together. It was a training day, very performance-related presentations. A few of the world's top coaches like Udo Neumann and Hiroshi Yasui and uh, Orr Stocker from Germany gave presentations, and then a couple of researchers like Simon Fryer and Ava Lopez, who have done some very specific studies on what's going on in the forums of climbers and the adaptations that occur from training. And then I gave my presentation, which was a qualitative analysis of two of the greatest ascents of 2017, at least in my mind they were, Adam Andre doing Silence and Margot Hayes doing the first female ascent of Biography. And in doing that presentation and the results of it, I shared my conceptual model for elite sport climbing and the energy systems that are required for elite route climbing. And so it was an awesome week. And to top it off, 
the World Cup circuit was in Chamonix that week, so we got to see the world's top speed climbers and lead climbers on the town center competition wall with the snow-covered Mount Blanc in the background. One final thing before I get into the details of this podcast, I want to give a shout out to the organizers of this event, Pierre Lagunaire and Oliver Brosolo. Great work, gentlemen. So what I'm going to do here over the next 45 minutes or so is give you a brief summary of a few of the presentations and some of the practical applications or what to do information for you, the passionate climber who just wants to train more effectively and have more fun and climb a little harder at the crags. And so that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to share with you seven or eight summaries. And the first isn't really one that you're going to be able to take home any ideas from and apply. I want to share it with you because I think it's just cool. It gives you a sense of kind of some of the -the out-of-the-box ideas and things that uh, researchers are doing. And uh, this is by a French researcher, Lionel Rivray, and uh, his presentation was about 3D motion analysis of speed climbing. Now, speed climbing is going to be one of the three disciplines in the Olympics. And so for these national climbing teams, uh, developing their speed climbers, analyzing their movements right down to the split second is critical because, you know, speed climbing, it's how fast you can climb this standardized 15 meter wall. And I mean, these world-class speed climbers literally sprint up the wall. I believe the world record for men is 5.48 5.48 seconds to climb this 15 meter problem. And um, to be even competitive, uh, I guess if you want to have a shot at a medal, you probably have to be able to speed climb this 15 meter wall in about six seconds for men and under eight seconds for women. And so if you're a coach trying to advance your team of speed climbers, well, it gets down to hundreds of a second, just kind of like running the 100-meter dash is a matter of how do you shave off hundreds of a second through training interventions and technical improvements. And of course, uh, speed climbing is far more complex than running the 100-meter dash in a straight line because this standardized speed route, if you've never seen it, um, isn't a straight line. It does kind of weave back and forth a few times as the climbers race up the wall. And so what Lionel did, and and this is really cool, is he synchronized two drones with HD cameras that would hover behind the speed climber and rise upward at about the same speed as the speed climber. And then with trackers on the climber, you know, basically some type of optical sensor attached to the harness near the center of gravity, he's able to track climbers and then model in 3D the movement of the climber up the wall. And so in that, be able to identify what makes one climber faster than another. It's not just how fast the muscles twitch, how fast the muscles contract, but it also comes down to, of course, center of gravity movement, because there is a lot of lateral movement involved in doing this speed climbing route. And so he presented uh, visual evidence, videos, and kind of the summary of results and and the ways he's able to discern what makes uh, one climber a little faster than another. And then they can go in and develop uh, training and practice strategies to make their climbers faster going up the wall. And so uh, I would expect that there's a good chance maybe one of these French climbers ends up on a podium in speed climbing because they have this type of technology at work to help guide them. Now, that being said, the Russians have an incredible tradition in speed climbing and the Iranians hold the current world record, at least for men, in speed climbing. And the Japanese have some of the best coaching and focus and just kind of team approach to these things. And so uh, I think it's going to be quite exciting to see how things play out two years from now in the 2020 Olympics where speed climbing makes its debut. Okay, so let's move on to the second presentation that I'm going to share with you. Again, there were 
dozens of presentations, and I'm just picking out a few that I want to share in, uh, kind of in a nutshell. And this one's by a French researcher, Leray Vigreau, I believe is approximately how you say his name. And his presentation is titled, Effective Climbing Hold Depth on Biomechanical Arm Action During Pull-Ups. Now that sounds kind of esoteric and you're probably thinking, how is this going to have any practical application? But hang with me, it will. In fact, this is one of the studies that really reveals some useful information about training finger strength and pull-up training uh, that we do in the gym. And it also supports what I've been teaching and some other coaches have been teaching for a few years in terms of uh, the methodology of grip strength training and arm strength and endurance training. So uh, what he did is he brought a group of climbers into the gym and hooked them up. Uh, had a kind of a clever setup with an Ava Lopez progression hangboard mounted onto a force sensor. And he was able to measure the vertical force applied by the climber on each supporting grip and also measure muscle EMG uh, both the finger flexor and extensor muscles were being recorded simultaneously to these exercises being done and the goal was to kind of see you know in terms of uh, pulling power what grip position or size of grip a large hold versus a small crimp or a pull-up bar versus a hangboard hold what type of forces, what type of pulling forces could be generated based on the grip you're using in training? And, you know, because a lot of climbers do pull-up training on a variety of instruments, from pull-up bars to jug holds on a hangboard to teeny tiny holds on a hangboard. And so what is the best size hold for training, say, maximum strength on pull-ups versus training finger strength or finger endurance. And that's really what this study gets to the bottom line on. So let me pass on some of the results and what kind of the take home points are. First of all, in terms of arm force and power generated, as you might expect, uh, the largest values were measured when the climber was hanging on or gripping uh, onto a pull-up bar so that the fingers were firmly fixed to a pull-up bar. And what that seemed to do is take out of the equation uh, the finger extensors and flexors and just the whole need to really stabilize the wrist joint. And so the climber can more powerfully engage and employ the pulling muscles. Whereas with uh, reduction in hold size, in fact, just going from the pull-up bar to the bucket hold on the hangboard, there was a small drop-off in pulling force. Uh, and it wasn't so significant that I would say that the jug hold or ledge hold on the top of a hangboard would be bad for pull-up training. But if you really want to isolate the pulling muscles for maximum strength training, the bar is probably the best way to go. Whereas if you want to do pull-ups to train strength and to some degree endurance of the supporting cast of stabilizer muscles of the forearm and uh, wrist, then the jug hold might be a good compromise. Now as the hold size decreased, they observed a decrease in the number of pull-ups that could be performed a decrease in maximal power, and a decrease in maximal force applied. So compared to the maximum power and force that could be applied on the pull-up bar, when they took measurements on the 22 millimeter hold, which is about the size of one finger pad for most climbers, there was a 17% reduction in the force applied. And then dropping down to the 18 millimeter hold, that uh, force reduction was uh, 19%. And then all the way down to the 10 millimeter hold, which is as small as they went, there was a 31% reduction. So almost a one third reduction in the maximum pulling force that could be applied on that smaller hold. And along with that reduction in pulling force, they found an increase in EMG activity of the finger flexor and extensor muscles. So in other words, they are being recruited more to maintain the grip on the smaller holds. So as holds get smaller, 
the exercise becomes less about training the large pulling muscles and more about just stabilizing your wrist and your finger grip onto the hangboard. And so this goes along with kind of what I think experienced climbers and trainers intuitively get and what we as coaches teach is that for training maximum pull-up strength, like in doing weighted pull-ups, for example, putting on a weight belt or a weight vest, use a pull-up bar, remove the grip from the equation, and you can really uh, maximally engage and uh, create the highest pulling force with your large pulling muscles. And so if the goal is to build pull muscle strength, then using real small holds like the 18 or 14 or 20 millimeter hold isn't the way to go because you just won't be able to generate the high forces uh, that will maximally recruit the larger pulling muscles. Now, if you want to train finger strength, that's a different story. Or even finger endurance. I, you know, doing fingertip pull-ups say on a 18 or 22 millimeter edge, like a full pad crimp hold, would be kind of a blend of uh, finger endurance training and pull-up endurance training. Doing several sets of fingertip pull-ups on your hangboard is obviously fairly climbing specific, but it wouldn't be the best for training pull-up maximum strength nor finger grip maximum strength. So it's kind of a compromise that would mimic endurance climbing fairly well, but not be the ideal method of training pull-up strength nor maximum finger strength. And let's finish up with a couple of points about training maximum finger strength. Well, the best way to do that is with hangs, not doing any pull-ups at all. So you remove the pulling motion from the equation and just do dead hangs with a fairly high weight, a weight that at most, you could hang on 12 seconds, but maybe you're only doing 7 to 10 second hangs. So you're stopping a little short of failure, but there's still maximum efforts. That's the best way to train maximum grip strength. And of course, I've gone into the protocols for this type of thing extensively in previous podcasts. Uh, maybe revisit the Alactic Energy System Training Podcast, and you'll get some uh, information on that. And a final comment, when it comes to contact strength, what some people call finger power or more scientifically correct rate of force development, like how quick you can summon a high finger force. The best way to do that is on a campus board by laddering on a campus board as an entry level exercise and then doing double dinos on a campus board, which is the ultimate in, in increasing your power in the arms and the rate at which you can develop force in your fingers, which is very important for high end climbing and especially high end bouldering. Okay, so moving on to the third uh, research highlight that I'm going to feature here in this podcast. It relates to epiphyseal fractures, more commonly referred to as growth plate fractures in adolescent climbers. And this is an important topic that I've really educated myself on over the last 10 years or so, because I have two teenage boys who are thankfully almost through the risk period in terms of the growth plate problems. But uh, with the growth of climbing worldwide, uh, competition climbing, youth climbing, uh, this is an important subject to study. And there's been a small group of individuals uh, over the last 15 years gathering data, doing studies, and treating climbers with these injuries. And although this paper is by a Swiss researcher, Andrea Schweitzer, I should also point out that the initial studies were by a couple of German physicians Hockholzer and my friend Volker Schofel, who in recent years, Volker and his wife uh, Isabel have done a tremendous amount of work on uh, gathering data uh, from youth climbers in Germany and in Europe. Uh, and also even here in North America, Dr. Yasser El Sheik, uh, a Canadian physician out of Toronto, has been uh, treating and even doing surgery on uh, a few climbers that have uh, developed significant growth plate 
fractures. And so while I'm not going to be long-winded here because I understand this doesn't relate to maybe the average adult climber, if you are a coach or if you're a parent or someone that uh, deals with youth climbers, then this is a topic you really want to really do a deeper drill down on beyond what I'm going to present to you here in the podcast. But in a nutshell, uh, the growth plates uh, in the middle joint, the PIP joint of the two long fingers, the middle finger and ring finger are where this uh, condition is most commonly seen. Uh, And I believe in like 80 5% of the cases, it's the the middle finger, the longest finger. And it develops uh, in youths ages, say, 9 to 13, most common in girls and probably more like 12 to 16 in boys uh, because uh, girls reach their adult height and the growth plates close at a younger age than the boys do. Now, my younger son, Jonathan, who's age 16, is right in the peak of his growth spurt, and his growth plates are wide open, and he's at high risk for this injury, whereas my older boy, Cameron, is now 18. His growth plates, as we've seen on x-ray, are closed, and so he's he's made it through without problems, thank goodness. And so it's during this period of peak growth velocity, that one or two years where the adolescent is growing the fastest, that this injury is most commonly observed and can really become debilitating uh, if the adolescent isn't withdrawn from climbing uh, for a period of time to to let the injury heal. And so what this study by Schweitzer wanted to do, and kind of the really practical information that we can glean from it, relates to the stress placed uh, on the fingers by different grip positions. And he uh, set up a very clever jig where he could have climbers elicit full finger force in three different grip positions, the open grip, the half open grip as he calls it, or open crimp, and then the more typical crimp grip where the uh, PIP joint is bent at 90 degrees or so. And what he was able to do via ultrasound is examine that PIP joint and look at the orientation and relationship between the two bones that meet there. And so with this arrangement, he was able to take measurements of the different gripping positions, both loaded and unloaded, and then be able to kind of take some measurements and see the translation of that middle phalanx. Uh, And what he discovered is the crimp grip is by far the most stressful. In fact, it's where the middle phalanx was displaced the greatest and uh, therefore increased the pressure on that dorsal part of the PIP joint. That's right where you tend to get the bone fragment, the the breaking of the growth plate that results in the pain and, if not treated, eventually failed healing and uh, disfigurement. And so the other side of the coin was that uh, the measurements he took in the open grip and uh, half crimp grip, or half open grip as he called it, were much less versus the 0.9 millimeter displacement in the crimp grip. The displacement in the open crimp was about half of that, about 0.4 millimeters. And in the open hand grip, it was insignificant, only around two hundredths of a millimeter. And so for youth climbers uh, in that growth spurt, almost exclusive use of the open hand grip is the safest way to proceed and will in all likelihood, not result in a growth plate fracture. However, uh, it's impossible to climb entirely with the open hand grip. There are small holds, you know, tiny holds, in-cut holds that demand a crimp grip. And so I guess the message for youth climbers and coaches should be to minimize those types of holds on problems and in training. Obviously, fingerboard training would be a bad thing on small crimps. Whereas perhaps hanging on open hand slopers or open hand deep pockets isn't so uh, risky for a youth climber. And so just to wrap up this section here and give you some of my own personal opinions on things, uh, all youth climbers, the, the passionate kids that are in the gym a few days a week, should be monitored for pain that uh, develops typically first in the middle finger and often bilaterally. Uh, And at the first sign of pain, it would be very prudent to uh, down-regulate training, have a discussion with the uh, youth climber and the parents about growth plate injuries, and to 
encourage the youth climber to avoid the crimp grip whenever possible, stay away from the hangboard and the campus board as much as possible, uh, and hopefully be able to navigate that couple of year period where those growth plates are most prone to fatigue and failure without getting injured, which has been the case with my kids. They've been able to climb pretty hard through their growth spurt years, but I've monitored them very closely. I've adjusted their training appropriately, and I've dialed them back during weeks or months or seasons where they've had that middle knuckle pain become more significant above, say, a one or two out of 10 on the pain scale, they should be dialed back. And if the pain becomes significant, the swelling becomes significant, by all means, consult a doctor who has experience with these types of injuries. A simple x-ray can very quickly reveal if there's a growth plate fracture or not. And as the doctors I mentioned earlier have documented, a growth plate fracture not attended to will get worse and may eventually heal uh, displaced and lead to disfigurement of the finger to some degree. And, and there are some adult climbers walking around with slightly crooked fingers as a result of a growth plate fracture during their youth climbing years that p- perhaps not recognized or were ignored or untreated. And so that's what we want to avoid is having these climbers become disfigured or even uh, losing some functionality of the finger, which can happen if this injury isn't properly treated and dealt with. Next up, we have a study from a Norwegian researcher, and I'm going to butcher his name, and I apologize for that, but I believe it's Vigard Verede. And uh, his study was on the association between the rate of force development, uh, finger force development, and climbing performance. And this is a really interesting topic for exercise physiologists because we know in other sports, there's a strong correlation between uh, the rate of force development and athletic performance, especially in power sports like sprinting and jumping and even field sports where there's a lot of quick lateral movements athletes with a high rate of force development tend to excel, tend to be some of the best, at least in terms of the physical attributes. Now, with regard to climbing, you know, it's a little different kind of sport than the field sports. And, uh, you know, many climbers, especially rope climbers, tend to move quite slowly and cautiously with lots of static movements, as we often refer to them. But then boulderers, and certainly uh, the best sport climbers working the hardest routes with bouldery like cruxes, do tend to use a lot of powerful movements, dead points and dinos. And those are the types of moves that we're interested in here because they would involve high rates of force development. But you need to collect data to really understand what is going on. And there's a few interesting upshots from this study. And I guess before I dig into them, I should mention there's been a few previous studies that looked at uh, maximum finger force, like what is the highest finger force a climber can elicit on a crimp hold, say a 20 millimeter hold over the course of a few seconds. That's a very important measurement. It's It's a benchmark or a key performance indicator, as it's sometimes called that peak finger force, especially relative to your body mass, is very important. It's something we want to train up constantly, if at all possible, to help you climb harder. But then the rate of force development is how quick you can generate force. And that's not just a function of muscular strength, but there's a lot more going on there in terms of the nervous system and recruitment but also with regard to the tendons and extracellular matrix that transmit the force from the sarcomeres, from the contracting fibers to the bone to flex your fingers to generate the force. And so rate of force development is a different animal from maximum finger force. They are related, but they are uh, trained in different ways, and uh, some people are more fast twitch and quicker than others naturally. And the early studies on rate of force development with climbers revealed that boulders, elite boulders, had the highest rate of force development 
compared to, say, rope climbers, which, again, makes sense because if you're bouldering a lot, you're doing a lot of lunging and dead pointing, and you're probably campus training a lot versus a rope climber who might just be rope climbing a lot. And so the rope climber is developing more endurance adaptations and the boulder are more strength and power adaptations. So that all makes sense. I think you're probably nodding your head and agreeing with me on that. So in any case, this study was more about I guess the future when it comes to testing a climber and seeing where they fit in in terms of their um, not only maximum finger force but the rate of force development and uh, if you if we can measure this in a meaningful way as coaches we can then put people on training programs and retest and gauge results and so what the researcher did here was with a, a force gauge uh, with a high hertz sampling rate is able to measure the rate of force development of a contraction. And you, know, you need to measure this in milliseconds because it happens quickly. You know, sprinters probably have the highest rate of force development on the planet. You know, an Olympic sprinter. They're hitting the ground and generating force very quickly in less than 100 milliseconds. So these are incredibly powerful athletes. Uh, jumpers also uh, have a high rate of force development, though not as quick. Uh, they tend to generate force in the 100 to 300 millisecond range. That's where the rate of force development is the greatest. And what this study found out is climbers, the boulders, the elite climbers, uh, rate of force development is similar to the jumpers. Now again, jumpers, you're measuring lower body force generated by the leg muscles and hip muscles in sprinting and jumping. And in a climber, we're measuring what is being generated in the upper body, specifically relative finger force. And what they found is that the, the rate of force development in the first 100 milliseconds was unremarkable. Uh, again, nothing similar to the sprinter's ability to generate force quickly. But between 100 and 300 milliseconds, you could discriminate one climber from another. And they looked at it in 50 millisecond increments. And they took measurements, and then they were able to do various calculations of absolute and peak finger force, and most importantly, rate of force development relative to body weight. Because like maximum finger force, it really comes down to what the value is relative to your own body weight. And that's why elite climbers need to be strong, powerful, and on the light side, because uh, these relative measurements are what are most discriminating. Now, before I wrap up this section on rate of force development, I want to mention another study that was also presented at IRCRA. Uh, I believe it was on the last day, on the training day. And it was by a French researcher, Guillaume Levener, and he collected rate of force development data with novice, intermediate, and elite climbers. And what he presented was that he found most revealing was the rate of force development in the first 200 milliseconds. So in other words, how high of a force could you generate by the 200 millisecond mark? I would imagine if you're doing a lunge to a small crimp, that's a really important attribute. How much force you can generate in that first two tenths of a second. Because to stick a small hold in a lunge, you probably need to generate a pretty high force in a very brief time. And so climbers that can stick that lunge to a small edge probably have a high rate of force development in that first 200 milliseconds. And he mentions that it's really that contractile impulse is mainly a function of the nervous system and motor unit discharge. However, the force development beyond 200 milliseconds it's not unimportant, but it's more a result of the muscle tendon unit and those adaptations that perhaps come about more from long-term training that result in structural changes of the muscle and the tendon and the extracellular matrix. So the first 200 milliseconds is more neural adaptations, which probably most climbers can uh, train up in a pretty short period of time, a matter of a few weeks. You will likely be able to train up the amount of force you can generate in that first 200 milliseconds. Do a campus training program for a few weeks and you will improve, but only to a point. 
that first part of the force time curve can only adapt so much. But more long term, you can generate that later portion of the force time curve, say from 200 to 300 milliseconds, which is not unimportant, that can be trained up more long term via various training adaptations that improve muscular strength and force transfer through the extracellular matrix and the tendon to the bone. And so as a climbing coach, I guess the three key performance indicators I'd want to test and track with regard to finger strength and power is number one, What is the maximum voluntary contraction? How much force can they summon on, say, a 20 millimeter edge in a three to five second effort? And then two, how fast can they summon 95% of that maximum voluntary contraction? And then three, what is their rate of force development in the first 200 milliseconds? That is, how much force can they generate in just two tenths of a second, which seems to be a critical value to know in discerning somebody's ability to stick small holds on dead point and on lunge. Next up, we have a study from my friend, researcher Eva Lopez Rivera from Spain. And, you know, she's been prolific in recent years in doing various studies relating to hangboard training and finger force measuring. And uh, her research is some of the most commonly referred to when it comes to research on effective training interventions. You know, a lot of the research that's being done in climbing doesn't directly apply to, to training, to what we as coaches or you as an athlete are interested in learning. We're getting there, and there are some researchers doing that type of work. But uh, at this conference in Chamonix, there was a wealth of research in other areas, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, medicine and biomechanics and movement and the psychological and sociological side of our sport. But when it comes to information that we can leverage to train more effectively and improve climbing performance, there's still a relatively small number of studies, you know, maybe only 10 or 20% of the climbing research being done directly applies to training for climbing. And so uh, Ava has a series of studies that she's been building over the years relating to training and her two hangboards, the uh, progression and transgression are popular hangboards. I have one in my basement that I frequently train on. And so in any case, this study, uh, what she wanted to look at, and and this is something important that I often talk about, is the difference in putting a, um, a weaker climber on a hangboard training program compared to a strong climber, a well-trained climber. You know, a lot of studies done in exercise physiology, and I read dozens and hundreds of papers in a wide range of sports on this subject. The majority of them, when you read the details, when you get beyond the abstract, uh, the participants in the study are often referred to as untrained or recreational. And so naturally, the training interventions that are studied and the results that are gleaned from those studies reflect what a uh, not-so-well-trained or beginner or recreational athlete gets from a training program. And sometimes experienced athletes take those results and assume they're going to apply to themselves. And a well-trained athlete, of course, does not respond to training the same way as a less strong athlete does. And so that's something that Ava is getting into here in this study. You know, there's been some previous hangboard studies. Uh, Ava's studies and the Anderson brothers did a study, I, I believe, based on a survey where people performed their training program and took measurements and gave them results. And of course, these studies show a fantastic improvement in finger strength when you go on a set program. But that's the first time doing the program, the first four weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks that you do the program, you see this impressive ramp up. Sometimes week over week, you get steady gains. But that doesn't go on forever. And the 
results of those studies can't be applied to a well-trained climber who's been using a fingerboard for years, who's been climbing at a high level for years. Gains for those types of people, and that might be you if you're a high-end, experienced, well-trained climber, as you know, eking out further gains is easier said than done. And the training interventions that are going to get you to that next level of strength and power aren't the ones that are being studied or aren't the ones that were effective to newbie climbers or recreational athletes or lower strength climbers. And Ava proves that for us here in this study. What she did was take a group of experienced climbers and she did uh, initial finger force testing uh, where she, on a 15 millimeter edge, determined the maximum amount of weight that could be added to their body and uh, maintain a grip for five seconds. And she also tested their endurance by doing a hanging test to failure on an 11 millimeter edge. And then she took the climbers after that initial test and broke them into two groups based on their maximum grip strength that she measured in the first five second test. She had a group of what you might call low strength climbers and a group of high strength climbers. And then she had both groups embark on the same hangboard training program. And it's the popular program that she has promoted, and it's in my book where you do three to five 10 second hangs with a maximum added weight with a three minute rest in between. So that's a basic entry level hangboard training program. It's certainly not high volume, it's actually quite low volume, but it is high intensity, just the program you'd want to do to develop maximum finger strength. And so she had these uh, climbers engage in this maximum strength hangboard training program for four weeks, and then she brought them back in and retested them both ways for strength and endurance. The endurance test being, again, a hang to failure on an 11 millimeter edge, and the strength test determining what is the maximum added weight they can hold for a five second hang on a 15 millimeter edge. And the results are interesting and pretty much what I expected and what I guess many coaches and advanced climbers would expect is that the low strength climbers had significant gains in both strength and endurance. In fact, the four weeks of training resulted in almost a 36% increase in maximum strength for the low strength climbers. And interestingly, their endurance went up about 36% as well. And they weren't doing, this was not an endurance training program. This was a maximum strength training program. So for those lower strength climbers, they got much stronger, about 36% increase in maximum grip strength. And their endurance increased quite significantly as well, which goes to show that getting stronger also will tend to improve your endurance, especially in the early stages of training for climbing, because it allows you to operate at a lower overall power output. And really, as, you, as your finger strength gets stronger, small holds get bigger. So of course you can endure longer. Now, what about the results for the high strength climbers doing the exact same training program? Well, their maximum finger strength only went up 4%. So a very small increase over the course of a four-week training program. And get this, their endurance actually went down a little over 4%. Now, when we're talking about just a few percent of increase or decrease, you may be in the noise there. And there's other factors that come in to play. I often point out when it comes to testing climbers that everything from the ambient weather conditions, you know, the temperature and the humidity uh, on the day of the test, to how well the climber warmed up before the test, to how uh, well recovered the climber is before the test, uh, you know, if they've had three rest days versus one rest day, uh, they're going to test differently. And even verbal encouragement is a big one. Verbal encouragement, if you have uh, someone testing you, standing over you yelling to hang on longer, 
you will hang on longer. I mean, that alone can make about a 10% difference. So I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but when it comes to measuring finger force and doing these different finger tests, it's very difficult to control all of those factors. And I think some climbers and coaches go down a, a dubious path where they try to compare one climber to another or uh, develop a database of uh, grip strength when all of these factors haven't been controlled. Uh, you really aren't really sure what you're measuring. And so I do anticipate in coming years we're going to have protocols and a methodology that will allow us to do more controlled testing and make the results more reliable. But in any case, Ava definitely knows what she's doing here, and the results of her study make good sense, is that the low-strength climber benefited a lot more from the four-week training program than the higher-strength climber. Now, of course, if they uh, returned and did another four-week uh, training cycle, of the same program, I wouldn't expect the low strength climber would get the same 36% increase. It would likely be less because as you get stronger and more well-trained, the gains are harder to come by. And so the bottom line here is if you're new to training, you can do one of these basic hangboard training programs that are out there in the various books or out on the internet and get good results out of them. But these programs that have been presented by uh, researchers, developed by people like Ava and the Anderson brothers and myself. I have a few hangboard protocols that I've developed and really believe in. Well, you still need to find ways to escalate the training. And it's not just about doing more. You need to go into more complex training interventions that involve the blending of a campus board and a hangboard to, to get both the neurological adaptations, the uh, the musculotendon adaptations and all the adaptations that come about relating to connective tissue and tendons. Those are the things that long term will help you add on a few percent per month or maybe only per year if you're a highly trained pro climber. If you can gain a few percent per year, you're on the path to the next level, you know, because at the elite levels in any sport, a few percent is a big difference. And so, uh, yeah, that's just something to keep in mind from, uh, from this study is that the training program that works for one climber won't necessarily have the same results for the next climber. And the training program you used last season that really worked probably won't be quite as effective this season because you are a different climber than you were last season. So that speaks to the importance of program design and just the art of uh, season over season, year over year, making your program a smarter training program, not necessarily a more voluminous training program, although volume is something that does generally need to increase as you advance as a climber, but you also need to train more smartly and really need to discover and leverage the few things that are going to be difference makers for you going forward. And those are the things that I hope you're learning from listening to this Training for Climbing podcast each and every month, is getting some new ideas, learning the climbing science and the science of effective training, and hopefully giving you the tools and some uh, useful information to take your training and your climbing to the next level. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up this podcast with my presentation that I presented at the end of the training day. It was kind of a keynote capstone type presentation that um, I wanted to be inspiring. And so I presented videos of two of 2017's greatest ascents. And then I proposed or presented my conceptual model for maximum difficulty sport climbing and the energy system requirements for elite level roped climbing. And so I'm going to share much of this with you, minus the video. <laughs> um, but I'm sure you've perhaps seen the videos of, uh, of these two climbs, and perhaps you want to revisit them after hearing this podcast because uh, they were quite remarkable ascents. And so I'm going to kind of read some of this to you. So if it sounds like I'm reading, well, I am. Uh, so here's the introduction. The past year has featured several extraordinary and barrier-breaking ascents, including multiple female 515A ascents and Adamandra's mind-boggling ascent of Silence, the world's first 515D. 
While these accomplishments exemplify indomitable focus and technical perfection reminiscent of an Olympic gold medal performance, sport climbing at the highest level also demands expression of both high levels of anaerobic and aerobic power. While many other sports tend to favor either high anaerobic power, for example, sprinting and gymnastics, or high aerobic power, distance running, swimming, and similar, elite-level sport climbing, as exemplified by ascents such as silence and Margot Hayes' ascent of biography, demands a rare combination of high anaerobic power for dynamic moves and crux boulder problems, anaerobic capacity for 20 to 90 seconds of sustained near-maximal effort, and high aerobic power, or let's call it climbing-specific VO2, to drive rapid recovery during between-grip micro-rests and longer mid-route rest positions. Qualitative analysis of Hayes and Andre's ascents provide clues as to the necessary success strategy and energy system requirements for maximum difficulty sport climbs. Okay, so now I'm going to give you my analysis of the two ascents. Video analysis of two of the year's most remarkable ascents, and I'm talking about Margot Hayes' first female ascent of biography and Adam Andra's first ascent of silence, reveal surprising similarity of climbing pace and strategy despite vast differences in cliff angle, hold size, and route length. Biography is about 35 meters long with a cliff angle around 120 degrees and numerous tiny hold crux sequences, whereas silence is more than 50 meters long, severely overhung, and with several long, extreme, core-intensive boulder problems, but on generally better holds than biography. Okay, so let's get to the specifics of the Margot Hayes ascent of biography. Analysis of Hayes' Ascent of Biography reveals a high-intensity stop-and-go modus operandi reminiscent of intermittent sprint or intermittent max effort sports such as hockey, football, and mixed martial arts. Hayes climbed through each of the crux sequences in less than 55 seconds. Each of these bouts of high-intensity climbing was followed by a much longer period of static recovery at mid-route rest positions. Biography has five difficult sections of climbing separated by relatively poor quality rest positions. Hayes' high rate of climbing gets her through each of the five difficult sections in about 45, 38, 28, 42, and 55 seconds, respectively. While climbing, Hayes' finger flexor muscle time under tension on the tiny handholds was just one to five seconds per grip with an average rate of new hold acquisition of around 3.5 seconds. Hayes paused at poor quality rest positions for just over one minute, whereas she lingered for more than three minutes at the two better static rest positions. In climbing biography, Hayes spent more time in aggregate resting than she did climbing. Okay, so on to my video analysis of Andra's first ascent of silence, and then we'll kind of have a little bit of a wrap-up discussion about these two climbs and what you can kind of learn and apply from them. Analysis of Adam Andra's barrier-breaking ascent reveals a remarkably fast red point climbing pace. Having rehearsed the climb many times over two years of on-and-off work, Andra climbs at a startlingly fast pace with a remarkable lack of errors. It can be assumed that the ascent was made with exceptionally high economy, given all the time and effort that Adam put into working the route. Silence is a long route, approximately 50 meters, yet in total, Andre spent more time resting than he did climbing. After 20 meters of a 514A introductory climbing to get to a mid-route rest position, the first crux is a complex, contorted, 12-move V15 boulder problem, which Andra climbed through in 50 seconds to reach the next rest position. The second crux is a 20-move sequence, 
that's eight hand moves and 12 foot moves, which Andra climbed in just 25 seconds, a lightning rate of one hand or foot move every one and a quarter seconds. After a brief rest, Andra fired through the third crux, an ultra-steep 30-move sequence, this time 12 hand moves and 18 foot moves, which he completed in an astonishing 56 seconds. That's less than two seconds per hand and foot move. Mid-route rests on silence included a couple of knee bars, which allowed for hands-free, high-quality recovery for several minutes, whereas two other poor rest positions Andre paused at for only a little over 30 seconds each. Okay, so on to the discussion. Biography and silence present significant differences in technical challenges and route length, yet Hayes and Andra ascended their respective routes with remarkable similarity in strategy and pace. Both Hayes and Andra climbed the hardest sections of their respective routes in under 60 seconds from rest to rest position, an apparent necessity in order to maintain high enough anaerobic power for doing the route's many near-maximal moves. Both Hayes and Andra exhibited extremely brief finger flexor time under tension with an average finger grip of just three to four seconds per hold. Supporting their fast rate of climbing were near technically perfect performances. Neither climber adjusted their finger grips or hesitated during their well-rehearsed crux sequences, and only one time during each ascent did Hayes and Andre experience even a minor foot pop. Both climbers exhibited astonishing accuracy of movement despite an exceptionally fast rate of movement. Ironically, in successfully climbing their respective project routes, both Hayes and Andre spent more time resting than actually climbing. Given the remarkable similarity in climbing pace and economy, time spent resting, and strategy, I propose a conceptual model of maximum difficulty sport climbing as a long-form intermittent sprint sport, or perhaps more accurately, an intermittent near-maximal effort sport. It is well documented that intermittent sprint activities draw heavily on anaerobic alactic energy production during brief high-intensity efforts, although each successive effort increasingly draws on the anaerobic lactic and aerobic energy systems. Furthermore, brief micro-rests of around one second between finger grips and longer periods of recovery at mid-route rest positions elicit high oxygen kinetics to drive recovery via oxidative phosphorylation. This relatively balanced need for all three energy systems to contribute to ATP production, with particularly high demands on the anaerobic, alactic, and aerobic energy systems, is supported by previous climbing research showing respective contributions of the three energy systems being 42% aerobic, 36% alactic, and 22% anaerobic lactic. This is among elite climbers tested in a lab setting by Bertuzzi back in 2007. Both Hayes and Andre were able to pause and breathe deeply for 30 to 60 seconds at poor recovery positions, theoretically long enough for 50 to 70% of phosphocreatine resynthesis, whereas they tended to linger for three minutes or more at better rest positions, and that's sufficient for 90% or more phosphocreatine recovery and substantial intracellular clearance of hydrogen ions and lactate from the working muscles. Knowing the fast phase of recovery from peripheral fatigue is primarily an aerobic process, a strong cardiorespiratory system is an asset to accelerate recovery at marginal mid-climb rests and between climbs. Volker Schoffel in 2006 has shown that climbers who performed generalized aerobic training did recover faster between climbs. Locally, in the finger flexors, high capillarity, mitochondria density, and oxygen kinetics are essential. And Simon Fryer in 2015 has shown that elite climbers indeed deoxygenate and reoxygenate the finger flexor muscles faster than non-elite climbers. 
In conclusion, the qualitative analysis of these two leading edge ascents by Margot Hayes and Adam Andra, along with a growing body of peer-reviewed climbing research, support the conceptual model of maximum difficulty sport climbing as an intermittent, near-maximum effort activity. High economy and optimal bioenergetics are obtained via a climb fast between long rests strategy that maximizes anaerobic alactic and aerobic power output, thus reducing the burn rate of the anaerobic lactic energy system reserve, which is most often the energy system which fails a sport climber. Effective training interventions for sport climbers must therefore target development of all three energy systems with particular emphasis on increasing the anaerobic alactic and aerobic energy systems. Okay, so while I understand that probably came off a bit dry and certainly was missing the videos that I presented at the conference, I hope you kind of get the bottom line on these two incredible ascents and these two amazing climbers who got the job done. They practiced the route to the point of technical perfection so that they could do every move with maximum economy. And as I like to put it, they reduced the ATP cost of every move on the route to the bare minimum possible. And they did this by not making any mistakes, obviously putting their body position and their center of gravity in just the right spot for every move, doing some moves statically and some moves dynamically, and most important, climbing quickly, reducing that time under tension, reducing the length of each finger grip, reduces the burn rate of the anaerobic lactic system when you clamp down on a handhold and cut off blood flow, you are tapping into that anaerobic lactic system and draining that finite reserve. So by minimizing the time under tension, by keeping each hand grip as short as possible and getting from one rest to the next as quickly as possible, you stretch out that anaerobic reserve and hopefully get to the anchors before it fails, before you pump out. And so there are some lessons, both technical and tactical that you can take to the bank this weekend on your project. And in terms of training, well, most climbers tend to overtrain the anaerobic lactic system because they think that they need to be able to deal with the pump better. And yes, while you need to do some training of that system, most climbers do too little of the training of the other two energy systems, the anaerobic alactic and the local aerobic energy system. And so these are all topics that I addressed in great depth in previous podcasts. I did that series on energy systems that you know about. And so go back and revisit those to brush up on your exercise science and hopefully discover ways that you can come to train more effectively. One more thing I want to throw out to you here. Uh, You know, these researchers are doing a tremendous job developing uh, the science of climbing. And there's a small group of coaches who are kind of bridging the gap between the research and the climbers in the gym, the climbers at the crag. And so I would encourage you to reach out to one of these coaches if you have one of them nearby. I'm talking about folks like uh, Patrick Metros and Dickie Korb in Germany, or in the UK, there's Tom Randall and the Lattice Crew and uh, you know uh, Gresham and McLeod. You know, top-notch coaches like that are getting dialed into this material. In the United States, uh, out west, uh, Steve Bechtel and Tyler Nelson and my friends at The Power Company. These are the kind of folks that are embracing the science and applying it. And of course, there are countless coaches elsewhere around the country and around the world who are also learning this material and beginning to apply it. And of course, I'm happy to help lead the way in bringing climbing science to passionate climbers like yourself who are listening from around the world. Well, that does it for this episode of the Training for Climbing podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And if so, please share it with a friend and write a review. Until next time, be safe, be strong, and climb on.